Well, looks like you guys like the stalker video. So again, thank you very much for watching. Like I said in that video, I'll do an anomaly video if you guys like this one. I promise. So now it's time to take a look at Stalker's biggest mod, Anomaly. And it's bigger, actually it's way bigger, Brother Gamma. Anomaly is an extremely unique beast, and one of the most powerful mods I've ever seen compared to the game it's modifying. Usually, mods extend their games within their engine's limitations. But to make Anomaly, the wizards who built it have created their own custom forked 64-bit version of GSC GameWorld's X-Ray engine, called the Monolith Engine, that runs as a standalone instance from the base game series, and is completely free for you to install and run with a piss-easy setup. All you have to do is just download the mod, unzip it into a directory, and you're pretty much golden. No need for mod managers or jury-rigging it into your stalker install to get Anomaly up and running. This thing is smooth and sexy. Gamma is a different beast when it comes to installation overhead, though. As the install steps listed on the Gamma Discord makes it seem like I'm defrauding my own computer to install this thing. But that's also not as bad to install as it looks. But I'll speak on Gamma after I'm done yapping about Anomaly, as Gamma which stands for Grox Automated Modular Mod Pack for Anomaly, is a massive collection of over 400 Anomaly mods stuffed into one convenient package. Think of the All the Mods mod from Minecraft, if you're familiar with that. It's a good comparison. And I wholeheartedly applaud Grok and all the other Anomaly devs and contributors for the ungodly amount of man hours they must have put into developing this huge project, and getting all these mods to play nice with each other without having the Monolith engine melt down and create an elephant's foot of software crashes and memory leaks. Anomaly overhauls almost every aspect of the Stalker games to some degree, and its main goal is to be the ultimate version of Stalker, having the most content, locations, weapons, and things to do in general, which is apparent from the moment you boot up the game. Whether it succeeded in that goal seems to come down to how you enjoy Stalker, as I've seen many unfavorable posts about Anomaly and Gamma, with some Stalker players saying it deviates too far from Stalker's original vision, and adds too many modern survival mechanics, and ruins the game's atmosphere with too many tactical weapons, armors, and gameplay that leans more towards gunplay that's too refined in modern warfare to successfully capture that bushwhack, loner equipped with nothing but a rusty AK versus the unknowable horrors of the zone feel that the original games capture so well, and they feel mods like Lost Alpha do a much better job at fulfilling the dev's original vision. Is this true? Is Anomaly not real stalker? Let's take a look. And also, quick note, I will be playing Anomaly as it comes out of the box. No extra mods until I take a look at Gamma. I want that raw Anomaly experience, as it's the base Gamma builds off of. Unlike the mainline series that introduces you to the game's plot and protagonist via an opening cutscene, Stalker Anomaly opens with giving the player a menu to craft their game from. You can select any of the nine factions to start the game as, including Monolith. You have a thousand points to spend on starter equipment that you'll spawn in with, which you can use to buy weapons, ammo, and resources that'll make your start in Anomaly as smooth or as painful as you want. And you also have a few new modes that I didn't really mess with, but were cool to have regardless, such as the Azazel mode, which sees you taking control of a random stalker NPC when you die, giving the game an almost roguelike mode. The survival mode, a more gimmicky zombie apocalypse style game mode that replaces all spawns with zombies, who will slowly overrun you, making this the perfect mode for a I spent 100 days in a stalker zombie apocalypse type video. There's Warfare Mode, which seems to be a sort of reintegration of Clear Sky's Faction War system, with more dynamic factions that can take over other settlements and have their key leaders and traitors killed. And there's Iron Man Mode, which is like this game's hardcore mode, as upon death, your character's save will be completely nuked from your computer. And if I had to guess, the average Iron Man playthrough probably lasts around 20 minutes, and I can't imagine playing this mode, as all your progress will be lost if you take just one wrong step and stub your toe on an anomaly you didn't see. And that'll probably make me angrier than a stalker subreddit poster when you bring up Gamma. There are also save limiting modes like the campfire and agony modes which will block you from saving if you aren't near an actively lit campfire, or if you have any status effects like being irradiated, bleeding, or you're hungry, and so on for some optional pain and suffering if you're really into the hardcore survival elements of stalker. And I will be keeping these options off. This game is already pretty painful enough, I don't need the extra spanking. Lastly, you can also set the difficulty. For this playthrough, I went in light and centrist mode, going with medium difficulty and scavenger progression difficulty, which may raise an eyebrow, because what does progression difficulty mean? But no worries, I'll elaborate later. But for now, I pick story mode to see most of the content and enter the zone as a loner. Once you spawn in, you'll first notice the UI overhauls, which has been modernized and looks real sleek, coming with a bunch of quality of life menu features like item tabs and the ability to see what ammo your gun can use by hovering over your weapon, which highlights the relevant ammo types in the inventory. Sweet feature. Item condition is denoted by these green bars, and you'll notice that some items have white bars, which is how many usages the item has, which is a feature I really like the addition of, as it helps reduce inventory clutter and justifies the higher prices of items. you also notice that all electronic items now have blue bars that denote how much charge they have, which is one of the new features in Anomaly, batteries, 
which are just one of the several new item types that you'll have to keep track of and spend money on. If you run out of charge, you'll need to manually install the batteries into your devices to give them power again, which can put you at risk of your flashlight dying on you in a dark area or your PDA dying as you look for an objective. But the batteries are usually no big deal to buy and replace when the need arose, and they're fairly cheap compared to some of the other items in this mod. The new look menu is pretty sweet, and my one and only issue with it had to do with how it communicated my level of radiation poisoning to me, as the bar would get built up, but the icon wouldn't flash and I wouldn't take radiation damage. So I'm not sure if that built up bar meant it would take less radiation to get me sick, or what. I'm still trying to figure it out. I don't think I ever will at this rate. But regardless, once we equip any items we have in our inventory, equipping clothes or newly added backpack slots will play a short animation of your character putting their gear on. But there are also no actual animations for these new interactions and item usages, as the camera will just shake around to simulate our character's head moving and some relevant sound effects will play as if they were putting on clothes, eating or drinking, or healing. But this is something that Gamma directly addresses. The worst of these animations plays after chugging vodka, as your character's head will jerk around 90 degrees to simulate them shaking their head in disgust after taking a shot of nasty ass zone vodka. It's not that big of a deal, but it was extremely jarring to watch my POV swing around like this. I appreciate the addition of these animations, as they're attempting to make the game more realistic and immersive by forcing you to wait a few seconds to use an item as you would in real life. But it starts becoming pretty obtrusive in the middle of a firefight, as you have to hide in cover for several seconds staring at nothing waiting for the 10 second long first aid kit animation to end and give you access to your hands and weapons back, as they're completely inaccessible during the animations. But outside of these interruptions to the combat flow, I don't mind these animations at all. Once we strike out from this starter shack, you'll notice that all the sounds have been updated to a much higher quality. So no more 2007 compressed sounding footsteps, and no more interdimensional whooshing sounds when cycling through your inventory. Rest in peace to the stalker whoosh. We've been through a lot together, and I'll miss you, friend. This goes for pretty much every sound effect except for the PDA jingles and quest updates, which I'm glad stuck around. They're pretty iconic sounds. Also, Anomaly uses Fallout 3 and New Vegas sound effects for ammo and moving items around inventories. I'm not sure if that's fully legal or not, but hearing those classic crunchy ammo sounds made me soy pog for a sec in real life. And they even have the ominous wind blowing sound effect from 3. Anomaly also itemizes pretty much everything in the game, so items that were previously taken for granted like headlamps and knives are now separate items that need to be equipped and maintained. Even the PDA itself is now an equipable item, and instead of being a menu, the PDA is now an item the player physically holds in their hands, and your character's thumb will move and click buttons in sync with you using the mouse on the PDA. And I think this is a really damn cool new feature that, although small, adds so much more to the immersion of Anomaly, even though it can be a bit unwieldy at times, as you can right mouse button to zoom into the PDA. But it only works one way, and you can't zoom out until you put your PDA away, and I wish that right mouse button would just toggle zoom in and toggle zoom out, as the view of your PDA zoomed out is pretty small and hard to see, and your movement is locked into whatever direction you are facing when you're zoomed in. It's a small nitpick, but it adds up over time, which is something the game is not very friendly to, to say the least. But anyway, not only does it itemize pre-existing things like the PDA and the headlamps, it also adds a massive amount of new items, from crafting materials, to ammo components, to even inconsequential clutter items like watches, personal photos, notebooks, porno magazines, instruments, and so on and on and on. My favorite addition is that smoking is now a feature, and you can light up Russian cigarettes, Lucky Strikes, Marlboro Reds, and even joints, complete with the classic joint PNG image. <laughs> Fucking incredible. This is what modding is all about, baby. It's pretty hilarious to be able to kill a mutant dog and sell its body parts in exchange for a pack of Marlboro Reds, but these inconsequential items really add another human layer to the zone, and it makes the NPCs feel more like real-life people trying to eke out a life in the zone and are holding on to creature comforts for moral support. And I think a joint would help a ton to ease your nerves in this dangerous shithole. Another itemized addition I really liked was how each NPC will drop their faction patch on death, which can be sold for extra cash or used to complete quests. And I felt like this was a little unofficial bounty system in the game, and I really liked ripping off patches and banking them for cash. By the end of the Living Legend questline, I had like 90 monolith patches in my pack from the obligatory small towns worth of them I killed at the end of the questline. Let's move on to gunplay, which has been tightened way up for Anomaly. We can hunt some hogs with Fnatic the Tutorial Man here, he's now the Rookie Wrangler. Wolf got a promotion as Sidorovich's bunker guard, and this is where I got my first taste at combat. Anomaly's combat still maintains those brutal stalker gunfights, where bullets to both you and your enemies are extremely devastating, and headshots are pretty much always a one-hit kill, unless your opponent is heavily armored. The biggest difference here is that weapons are much more accurate and true to real-life weapons, and although I really enjoyed the mainline series' gunplay, going from starting with guns that were so weak and inaccurate that several players thought that their bullets were literally disappearing from the game, 
to guns that more or less hit where you're aiming at from most distances was a breath of fresh air. It felt like that first moment when you step off a musty plane after seven hours and take in that fresh and warm Hawaiian air. It's sublime. But this advanced accuracy goes both ways, and enemies are much more deadly and accurate, even on medium difficulty. Getting hit has been made a lot more impactful, literally. Your character will recoil in pain when getting hit, and sometimes bullets can hit you so hard they make you drop your current weapon, which is pretty annoying to have to pick up your gun off the ground like Velma when she drops her glasses, all the while you're getting hammered by enemy gunfire. But if you lose your gun, it's probably curtains for you anyway. And if you take a big hit and are close to death, your vision will start fading in and out, and you start swaying as your stalker's digital soul is leaving their mortal coil and barreling straight towards the gates of hell. And usually if I got down to that state, I would usually decide to just give up and do the mannequin challenge until I mowed down and tried the encounter again, as it was usually just the best option, as you'd have to burn expensive healing resources to bandage up and use a medkit, which thankfully did not go for the clear sky method of making you mummify yourself to stop a mild bleed. Instead, only one and at most two bandages are needed to stop the bleeding, but this is offset by bandages becoming more scarce and way more expensive, but it's still miles better than clear sky. And the bevy of new items gives you way more ways to heal, as you can use stim packs, morphine shots, and tourniquets to heal and stop bleeds. And using these new healing items usually comes at a hit to your food or drink levels, as apparently spiking morphine into your arm makes you hungry as shit. Attachments are now more common, and there are several attachment types for both NATO and Warsaw Pact weapons, and it's really cool to take a scope or silencer off an enemy weapon and attach it to your own. I threw this red dot sight on my refurbished AK, and felt pretty satisfied with myself, so that's pretty sweet. And finally, Thanks to this new, more realistic accuracy and a wider range of scope types, iron sights are much more viable now, and don't just have the gun model take up 30% of your POV without improving accuracy at all, and you'll be wanting to aim down your sights to check out these updated gun models and animations, which are both great. The hip firing is still as accurate as it was in the mainline series, and you can still use it to suss out faraway enemies, as the crosshair turns red when hovering over an enemy at any distance. The gun models and textures look great even by today's standards, and the new animations are smooth and modern. From the way weapons sway in your hands to the smooth reload animations. It's incredibly well done and really pulls the stalker guns and animations into the modern era. A big part of my enjoyment of Anomaly was just getting the weapons from the previous stalker games to see how their models and animations have been improved and how good they feel to shoot. Fnatic and I take on these hogs, and be careful, it's pretty tough for a tutorial battle. There's like three of them, and the hogs are on the tankier side as far as mutants go, so stay behind Fnatic and let him spray his AK to do most of the damage. And once they're all dead, you can pull out your knife to loot the bodies for some randomized mutant loot. Mutants and Anomaly are pretty interesting, and it's one of the aspects of Mainline Stalker that Anomaly tries to fully restore. Anomaly reintroduces several cut mutants like the gunless, more stereotypical zombies, the mutated lynx-like cat mutants, the long-armed Victor Wembenyama looking fracture mutants, the Karlik Gremlin Man mutant, and the scariest of them all, the Lurker, a frog-tiger hybrid thing that can power dive your ass from several meters away. It's fucking crazy. Killing these mutants also now allows you to skin them to harvest their meat and other mutant parts with a knife, as long as your knife is in good condition. This is a really great feature, and it gives the player reward for downing a mutant and expending their ammo, as you can sell the mutant parts for a modest sum of rubles, or cook their meat for food, letting you offset some of your ammo losses, as ammo is pretty damn expensive in Anomaly. Some mutants will require more than a few bullets to kill, and they move quick as fuck, so you're definitely bound to whiff a few shots when fighting them. My absolute favorite thing about the new mutants is when you go to skin a cat, there isn't an official portrait for the mutant. So instead, the mod devs used this picture of a regular ass cat and photoshopped a massive gash on the cat's chest. I love it. <laughs> Whose poor cat is this? But overall, these are some great additions that make the mutants more varied and provides mechanical motivation to hunt and harvest their parts beyond just killing digital abominations for the hell of it and watching your mutant kill count number go up. Once done with the mutants, Fnatic leads us to a nearby anomaly and gives us the rundown on artifact hunting, which has also been tweaked. Each map area now has several anomaly locations, much like Call of Pripyat's maps. Also like Call of Pripyat, each map now has highlighted areas of interest, and instead of them being all available at once, you have to discover them like you discover places in Skyrim. Which I like, of course. My Bethesda poison brain always gets tickled when I discover a new location, and it provides even more reason to just go out and explore the zone. Mechanically, artifact hunting remains unchanged. You still just have to whip out your detector and dodge anomalies to find your artifact, but bolts are now finite, itemized, and weigh 0.01 pounds. So that's just another thing you have to remember to keep a solid, but not too heavy supply of on hand. The biggest change has been made to the artifacts themselves, which now come in two types, active and inactive. Inactive artifacts do not emit radiation, do not provide any stat modifications, and pretty much exist only to get sold off for rubles, although they are much less valuable. 
The game itself even marks them as junk items. They're easier to find, being visible from any distance, and don't need a detector equipped to pick up. Active artifacts are your more typical artifacts, emitting radiation and providing stab bonuses. But to get those stab bonuses, you can't just throw the artifact on your belt like in the main series. Silly stalker, that'll beam radiation right up your Tuscano and melt you from the inside out. So, to equip one, you have to put it in an improvised or an advanced application module, which you can find on bodies or in caches usually, or you can receive some as quest rewards. The anomalies themselves always feel dangerous, and it's always a little puzzle to figure out how to reach the artifact without dying some horrible violent death. But after a while, it does start to become a boring routine to check all your usual anomalies to see if the emission RNG gods were kind enough to bless you with an active artifact. The worst of the anomalies are the psionic ones, as for some reason, when you take side damage, which is represented by the yellow top bar, your screen will be almost unusable as your stalker will see this admittedly cool, but extremely disorienting double vision. And if you lose all your side protection, the screen goes black and your character offs himself, which is pretty damn cool and pretty damn grim. The worst part of this psi fuckery though is that our psi health regenerates comically slow. So more subway surfers it is while I wait minutes for my stalker to recover from almost losing his mind. As combat is an absolute wash when psi damaged, you can't see shit. So you won't want to travel when geeked off the psi beams, as you might accidentally run into a mutant or any hostile stalkers, or you might trip on an anomaly you don't see and get yourself nuked off the zone. But back to artifact hunting. If you find and pick up an active artifact, you can't just let that shit sit in your inventory. You'll need to put the artifact in a lead-lined metal container, as your stalker will die from radiation exposure if they just have it sit in their back pocket. And you'll grow a massive tumor on your left ass cheek as you take your long hike to the closest scientist vendor to sell the artifact off for maximum profit. These new features and added steps make artifact hunting a more drawn out process, and it's designed to make you plan out your artifact hunts, as well as limiting you from grabbing a bunch of valuable artifacts and selling them off for massive ruble stacks that go higher than the brain scorcher. As a lead lined metal container with an active artifact inside of it can range anywhere from 4 to 8 kilos, which, for a stalker item, is fucking heavy. Anomaly is very interested in keeping progression a slow burn, and this is just one aspect of that design, but I'll talk more about that as I go on. Also, Active artifacts are way rarer than the inactive ones. In my playthrough, I'd guess around 80% of the time you'll find an inactive artifact at any given anomaly, and the other 20% are those rare times when you actually find an active one, and you'll be flush with these anomalous paperweights. Detectors are pretty much the same besides how much more expensive they are. The high-end Velas detector costs over 30,000 rubles, and the other difference is how they're tied to progression as lower tier detectors have out-of-date anomaly databases, which prevents the more valuable artifacts from spawning until you get the advanced detectors, and this is just another of several ways that the game caps your cash intake. Emissions are also back to refresh anomalies and maps, and the game still makes you sit and wait out the emissions for a few minutes each time. More subway servers. Sweet. But the updated effects the emissions give off are huge, and your screen will be shaking violently from the energy expulsions, and when the emission is over, the air outside and the skybox look fucking sweet. It's the best form of the emissions yet, and it really makes the zone feel more powerful than ever. But back to the tutorial. With the artifact in hand, we can sell it off to Old Sid for some nice starter cash, but I'd recommend you wait to sell the artifact until you find a scientist like my dog, Professor Sakharov, or Herman, who I don't like as much. It's just the, it's just his lips. He's, he's, he's too saucy. Vendors are now more dynamic and specialized in an anomaly, as certain vendors value certain items more than others, and vendors also take your factional reputation into account. And it's an interesting guessing game to try to figure out how to maximize profits by seeing which vendor is the biggest gooner, and who will pay the most for Russian Playboy. There are more types of vendors now too, with vendors like medics and cooks being added, which has the unfortunate side effect of making the barkeep now only sell food and drink related items, like an actual barkeep. You sadly can no longer go to the 100 Rads bar to buy a bottle of Cossack's vodka with a side of fully automatic NATO IL-86 from him. Damn, he was my favorite vendor in Shadow of Chernobyl too. But the vendors are also Anomaly's biggest gatekeepers and are the bottleneck to the game's progression. You're at their full mercy here. It seems that the ruble has been hit by some pretty nasty inflation since the mainline series games, and all items have had their prices jacked way up. 100 rounds of rifle ammo will run you over 10,000 rubles, and decent guns and armor will usually always be over 50,000 rubles. The higher end exosuit armor is being well over 100,000 rubles, and healing items will be a few thousand rubles a pop every time. You'll be making more rubles than ever selling artifacts, items, and doing an endless stream of side jobs, but you'll also be spending more rubles than ever on restocking your ammo and healing items, and buying food and drinks, and making repairs. And this inflation goes for the technicians as well, as repair prices have also gone through the roof. This AK costs over 30,000 rubles to restore, and armor quality gets melted by anomalies and taking damage so you'll have to spend racks upon racks buying upgrades and making periodic repairs. Progression is also bottlenecked by having all enemy weapons and armor drops be in piss poor condition, 
Seriously. The guns seem to work just fine when the enemy's using it, but when you kill them and pick it up, its quality is like at 18%. Maybe the last thing enemy stalkers do before they die is pour a bunch of acid on their weapons so it'll be in terrible condition when I go to pick it up. Even the canonically heavily armed and well-funded factions like the Monolith and the military have gear that's in absolute shambles. It removes that immediate satisfaction you get in the mainline games when you off a powerful enemy and take his sweet gun. But I also did like the sort of potential it brings. As if you kill an enemy and he has a sweet weapon you want to hold on to. It gives you the inherent motivation to get the cash to fix it up and use it for yourself, giving you a clear goal to look forward to. And that was my preferred way of getting better weapons. I went from an AK to an F2000 by grabbing the F2000 off a monolithian, running it back to my cordon stash, and holding on to it until I had enough cash to pay the technician to repair it. It was super satisfying and allows the player to acquire a wide range of guns at pretty much any time during your playthrough. Just as long as you got the cash to repair it. But back to technicians. Their upgrades are pretty pricey as well, and these technicians still need tools like they do in Call of Pripyat, but they'll pay well for these tools at least, which are easier to find, usually being found in stashes. These prices are here to make sure that the game's progression chart stays logarithmic, and that's by the dev's own admission, and Anomaly almost has an MMO slash Destiny 2-like progression to it, and no matter what, money will be grinded and hours will be burned, but the payoff of better weapons and armor is more than worth it. Just be aware that Anomaly may be free in terms of money, but you're not paying with your money to play Anomaly. You're paying with your time. But this is all modifiable. And if you don't vibe with the slow burn progression, you can always jack down progression difficulty to tourist and save a couple hours. From Sid, I'm just gonna call him that from now on. I keep butchering Sidorovich's name and I say it in multiple different ways. We can get started with Anomaly's main quest and a dynamic quest line which is seemingly a random questline that'll point you towards important characters to do missions for, and gives you a sort of pointed tour of the zone and its factions, some easier to reach than others. This dynamic questline seems to be no more than a randomly generated Bethesda-esque radiant quest of sorts, and fairly early on I ran into an issue with the quest when I was pointed to meet with Tukarev who is shacked all the way up in Yanov, which is inaccessible on one side due to the Brain Scorcher being back online, and on the other, the only ways to Yanov from the south are through the Red Forest and... Oh god no. The mosque. Still traumatized from the Steph Curry monolith construction yard, I take my chances in the Red Forest, which ended up being almost just as painful. Monolith have moved into the Red Forest, and were swarming the forest in the exterior of Forrester's house, and I was having a really hard time spotting the monolithians amongst the trees and bushes, as you can't see them through the thick foliage. But oh boy can they see you, and combat always turns to shit when bushes are involved. This was a problem in the main series too, but the foliage density wasn't as thick, so it didn't happen as often. But bushes and stalker only have hitboxes for the player when walking through them, so some brushing leaves and stick sound effects can play. But for enemies, bushes are invisible to them, and they can shoot right through them with excellent accuracy, which makes fighting in the red forest make me want to rip my eyes out, because I don't need them anyway. Because although foliage and anomaly looks great, it's thicker than your mom, and it's really damn hard to see through. An enemy AI keeps them shifty and constantly on the move to flank you, and you can bet that bastard AI is going to wiggle their way behind the nearest bush and spray you down with their x-ray vision. And since ammo was so expensive, I wasn't feeling too eager to spray into the bushes and potentially waste a clip or more to bush shot one guy. The only strategy I can think of here is to use your crosshair enemy highlighter cheese through the bush and hope those shots land. Mutants also get help from the bushes too, as the thick bushes can conceal them while they're rushing you, and you'll be oblivious to the fact that they're even there until they're chomping on your toes. But bush bitching aside, let's get back to the Red Forest. As I fight through these monolithian goons, I ran into some members of a faction called Sin lurking in these woods. Sin are a cut faction and an offshoot of monolith that are under the control of psychic mutants instead of the sea consciousness. It may also have been experimented on. It was pretty interesting to run into these guys but the edgy name and the blood red clothes were a bit much for me. They're trying too hard to one-up Monolith. There is a quest line that expands upon them called Mortal Sin, but that's a bit out of the scope of this video. There's also a new faction called UNISG, a group of scientists from the UN, which is a pretty cool faction idea, as outside of the mercs being implied to be foreign operators or working for Western nations, as foreigners seem to be surprisingly absent from the main series, as I know the USA and other European nations will be all over the zone in its space-time fuckery in the real world. So that's a nice re-addition to see. Speaking of absent people, before we strike out of the rookie village, we can meet Hip, a female stalker? Whoa, a woman in stalker? You know, looking back on it, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that the mainline stalker games contain zero female characters, making it a solid S on the based game tier list. I certainly don't remember seeing one myself, and characters don't talk about them much at all, not even in making a joke about their mom or something. 
but I couldn't really understand their Russian jokes anyway, so maybe they did. But it makes sense, I guess. I'm fairly certain no woman would want to operate in the zone amongst a sausage fest of morally dubious, heavily armed vagrant Slavs, who are shifty at best and fanatically violent at worst. But once the tutorial is complete and you feel stocked up and ready, Anomaly is pretty much open for you to live out your zone adventures in, and it's where Anomaly shines the brightest, as the zone is at its biggest and most alive having all available maps from previous games available, along with areas that were cut from the main series, like the Darkscape, a massive linear area that was intended to be the route the player had to take to escape through after being attacked by the military after they clear the X-18 lab in the Dark Valley. It's pretty interesting stuff, because Stalker was also originally intended to have drivable cars, and the Darkscape was made huge to accommodate said cars. I have no clue how vehicles would work at all in the main series. Strelog whipping a truck through the cordon, running over dogs and random stalkers seems fire, but it would make the game way too ridiculous, and would give the GSC devs side damage trying to implement vehicles in an engine that's held together with hopes and prayers. So it makes sense that it was scrapped. It adds other cut areas like the Dead City, a Merc stronghold area, and the Truck Cemetery, the by far largest map filled with rows and rows of decommissioned trucks and helicopters, and I hope you like hoofing it if you visit the place. And there's also the Meadow, a strange area with not much going on, but the vibes are immaculate here. It's incredibly ominous and quiet, real heebie-jeebie inducing place. And then finally, there's the Generators, north of the CMPP, which I haven't reached yet. Not only do we have all the maps and factions available, Anomaly also has a lively stalker social media where fellow stalkers will call out things they see and hear, from mutants they see to gunshots they hear and to loot they find. They'll also radio for things they need, such as escorts or backup and sometimes leave a radio for help when I have no chance of reaching them. Sorry bro, I'm not gonna take a hike from Yantar to the middle of the Great Swamps to help you fight a pseudo-dog behind a dumpster. That's like an 8 minute trek. But despite some of these futile messages, this feature is an awesome addition to Anomaly, and gives the zone its most dynamic interactions we've seen yet. It's super cool to be blasting some mutants and having another stalker be like, I just saw an incredibly muscular and attractive stalker shooting a dog. Can someone get me his number? or when your enemy's faction will radio in for help as you're attacking them, and it feels awesome to see their desperation as you gun them down one by one. It feels like the world is indifferent and chugging along with or without you, while simultaneously acknowledging your impact and actions, which is something open world games don't do really well. As other games, it usually feels like the player is the absolute center of the universe, and every event has to go through them. Here, you start as some broke, unknown, and unrespected bushwhack stalker who is just one of thousands, and you have to work hard to establish yourself and build relations with the factions for better prices and gear. And it's always satisfying to see that rumors of your exploits have increased message pop up, albeit it takes a long time for these factions to start liking you. You can do over a dozen missions for one faction and your reputation with them will go from completely neutral to only a slight, mild, might as well be a co-worker friend. It's just another way the game keeps that progression burning low. This huge, complete map and dynamic world do come with some downsides though as at times this game really turns into Take a Hike Simulator, as you may sometimes have to travel across several areas to reach an objective, and then have to leg it all the way back for your reward. And it makes sense in-game, and traveling's monotony is broken up by sporadic mutant attacks, artifact hunting at any nearby anomalies you pass by, and dodging some loose anomalies, which seem to pop up way more often. Many times I'd be sprinting through a map only to get one-shotted by an anomaly I didn't see coming, so watch your steps. But no matter what, you will be doing a lot of hiking, going from place to place, turning in and completing quests, traveling to sell to specific vendors, or to grab something from a stash you left behind. And all that walking really adds up over time. You're going to be on your proclaimer shit for a solid chunk of the game. There is fast travel, but it has a much reduced role from its clear sky peak. You can travel using guides, who are usually loitering around settlements like the bar in Skadovsk, but they are limited to only being able to travel to a limited number of nearby areas, and going from one guide to another may be needed if you're going from somewhere like Zayton all the way back to the garbage or cordon. And each trip will cost anywhere from 2,000 to 6,000 rubles a pop depending on distance. An anomaly takes any opportunity to squeeze rubles out of you. And if you don't want to pay, you have to take the hike yourself, which can last over 10 minutes of running and stopping to regenerate your stamina meter. And you also run the risk of getting into fights with tough enemy squads and mutants who will dwindle your healing supplies and ammo, forcing you to spend money regardless to replenish your stores. So, Stalker. What will it be? Will you pay with money, or time, and money? Another consequence of this game's dynamic structure is that sometimes when you're on your way to do an assassination mission, the game might get a little too excited, and since the game is more dynamic and independent than ever, I've had a few times where my target would get into a fight, and end up getting killed before I even reached the objective, saving me from making the full trip and still allowing me to turn in the quest for a reward, letting you inadvertently scam your quest giver by taking credit for the work you didn't do. In the zone, it's fleeced or be fleeced. 
And from here, Anomaly is pretty much the ultimate stalker sandbox, and you'll be doing all your favorite classic stalker activities in the pursuit of rubles. And your enjoyment of Anomaly will boil down to how much you enjoy Stalker's world, its quests, its refined combat, and how finely tuned your experience is. And although Anomaly is a standalone game that you can boot up for free, I still highly recommend playing at least Shadow of Chernobyl before diving into Anomaly, as being familiar with the series' structure, mechanics, setting, and story will go a long way in reducing the overhead of getting familiar and comfortable with Anomaly. You'll also be more prepared for the added survival mechanics of needing to eat, drink, and sleep to manage statuses. And if you played all the games, Anomaly is an awesome trip down memory lane. And it's super dope to see what factions are where, what's new in each map, and where previous characters are, and seeing what's changed since the past games. Like when you meet Mr. Shotgun Doorbell Noah, and you find that he has a few new pseudo-dog puppies that'll push you around. And this little addition makes these abominations almost cute. Almost. Another interesting change is that Sultan and his bandit crew have left Zaytan for the Dark Valley. Seems Beard finally got tired of their let's rob and kill Beard meetings they'd have right in front of his face. And since I chose Loner, I was by default hostile to all bandits. And when traveling through the Dark Valley, I got into a fight with the bandits at their base and ended up putting a bullet in Sultan's head. As you can now kill important faction NPCs, and you're no longer forced to holster your weapon when in stalker camps. You can wave your boomstick around at anyone's face, and they just gotta accept it. Making faction leadership killable makes the game feel much more dynamic, and I commend any game that lets you off important NPCs. No one should be safe from the blammer, quest givers included. Todd Howard has made sure they've had it too good for too long. Make NPCs fear the player again. My goal for Anomaly was to complete the Living Legend questline, which is one of the three main questlines in the game that will send you all over the zone in search of the big dog Strelok himself. At least I think it's one of the three. I couldn't find an Anomaly wiki to save my life, and I can only find surprisingly little info about these mainline quests in Anomaly. Nobody really seems to be talking about them. But regardless, it seems that Big Dog Strelok has returned to the zone and is trying yet again to reach its center. Third time's the charm, right? <laughs> and since the only other available questline was just a chain of randomly generated side jobs, all my efforts in Anomaly were working towards gearing up to take on these missions in the inevitable monolithian death gauntlet I know is waiting for me at Pripyat in the CMPP. And I think I spent more time in Anomaly grinding up cash than I have playtime in all the mainline stalker games combined. I spent those hours completing jobs, offing mutants and undesirable stalkers, doing a lot of walking and running, and doing a shit ton of artifact hunting, as grabbing artifacts and selling them off to scientist vendors was my preferred way of making money. And it was always satisfying to put an artifact up for trade and seeing that I'm getting 10,000 plus rubles for it, even though most of the time that money would get immediately pissed away on ammo, supplies, and repairs. This game made me feel like a real-life Slavic laborer, but instead of mining oil and natural gases for money that'll all be spent on rent, food, and vodka, I was mining for artifacts and spending all that money on rebuying ammo I was seemingly almost always out of, and on repairs to keep my stalker suit from falling to bits on my body, as your armor condition can get shredded away pretty quickly, and anomalies just melt that shit right off of you. My exosuit was losing like 10% of its durability for being in a heat anomaly too long, and these technicians drive a king's ransom for repairs. It's like an artifact tax. But after several in-game days and hours, I had ranked up enough to buy an exosuit. As like in the past games, better tier weapons and items are blocked by your rank. And as you complete quests, reach new areas, and run up your kill counts, your zone notoriety also goes up, making vendors willing to sell you high-end gear, which ain't cheap. My exosuit had ran me around 110,000 rubles, and I probably spent more than double that after the fact just making repairs on the damn thing. But with my armor acquired, Next on the list is my weapon of choice, and for Anomaly, as I mentioned earlier, I decided to use the FN F2000, as it was the best assault rifle in the Shadow of Chernobyl, and I hoped its power and accuracy would carry over to Anomaly. So after fixing up the one I picked up, it was the weapon I used for the rest of my playthrough. And with the adjusted accuracy, you're pretty free to use any weapon you like the best, which I really like. The F2000 came with a built-in scope and was highly accurate without any upgrades. The upgrades are still around, but I didn't use them much for my weapons because I didn't really need them. My F2000 was already pretty accurate out of the box, and using armor-piercing rounds was a one-shot kill of the head, no matter how strong my enemy's armor was. So the gun upgrade seemed like a bit of a waste of money to me. I also didn't use many artifacts, only really using one that makes my stamina regenerate faster to make those long hikes between areas less of a complete slog. And the only other effect I'd want to use is the increased carry weight, which would allow me to make more money in a single go as I'd be able to carry more artifacts. And in a game like this, holding more shit and running faster and longer are the best upgrades you can get, as it's what you spend the most in-game time doing. Like I said, proclaimer shit. But with my gear taken care of and my money up after some honest work, we can now take a look at the game's main quest, Living Legend. Living Legend is what I would consider to be the quote, main quest of Anomaly. But Anomaly's focus is more on the sandbox and world, and the story takes a back seat to the open world. 
but I still love game stories, and I love telling them. And this particular story ties into the previous games and lore in some interesting ways. So let's dig into it. It'll be fun, I promise. Living Legend is available to every faction, and starts when you get a task from your faction leader. In my case, for the loners, the leader is Sidorovich, and we can get the quest from him. If you haven't played any Stalker games or didn't watch my last video, you'll be missing some context. So go watch that video if you haven't yet. It isn't dog shit, I promise. But anyway, Anomaly's story takes place in 2016, several years after the events of the main series. And it seems that Strelok, the world's most successful stalker, has returned to the zone. And rumors about him attempting to reach the center of the zone are yet again spreading amongst the other stalkers. And since Strelok never checked back in with Sid after the events of Shadow of Chernobyl, he wants us to find the man and learn about what he found at the center of the zone. Our first stop is to meet with Doctor at the far edge of the Great Swamps who has seemingly retired from a harsh life of stalking to retire to a nice and cozy hole in the ground with only a fireplace, a ripped out car seat, a loose tire, and a shovel to entertain him. But at least he's got a bucket to piss and shit in, and he's got his pseudo dog with him. Damn, he's a really humble guy. We ask him about Strelok, and he says he's not sure exactly where he is, but he points us towards his Agriprom underground base to get us started. And he also asks us to mention him to Strelok and ask him to visit sometime. Damn. Can we get this guy an apartment in Rostock or something? I feel bad that he's gotta live in this dirt hole all alone. The best way I can describe this questline is that it's a sort of greatest hits collection of missions from the Stalker trilogy, sending us to the Agriprom Underground and back to Strelok's hideout. And the mission has a very similar structure to how it is in Shadow of Chernobyl. Fight your way through the sewers until you reach Strelok's hideout and pick up some kind of document or information from it. Once we grab Strelok's notes out of his base, we can bring them to the barkeep, who tells us that Strelok had stopped by the bar only yesterday and appears to be heading north to the center of the zone, where there's a fly in the ointment. And the barkeep tells us that a seemingly strengthened monolith had turned the brain scorcher back on, making the center of the zone inaccessible again. Damn, back to square one. He adds that if we have any hope of finding Strelok, we should go talk to the gatekeeper at the army warehouses at the entrance to the Red Forest, as you may have seen him pass through. I speak to the gatekeeper, but it's essentially the same thing as in Shadow of Chernobyl. Talk to the gatekeeper, fight off a monolith attack squad coming from the radar, and once the monolithians have had their blood drained from their bodies, the gatekeeper tells us to head to Yantar, as we will need a Psy Protection headset from Sakharov, who will sell us an uncalibrated poopy shitty Psy Protector for 10,000 rubles, or will sell us a sexy sexy calibrated one for 7.5k rubles. Damn, my wallet is getting hosed here. I guess Sakharov got tired of Strelok never returning his Psy Protection prototypes, and he needs some insurance. I decided to pay full price for the headset, which will keep you from offing yourself when you're in Brain Scorcher territory, but it won't protect you from the Psy fields that are in anomalies. Those will still penetrate your headgear and will nuke your mind with TikTok street interviews. The uncalibrated one works the same as the full priced one, but will insta kill you if you decide to shut off the miracle machine in the lab in northern Yantar. I even looked up a video about what it does to confirm, but shutting that miracle machine down is an optional task, and you can easily get away with the uncalibrated headset if you skip the miracle machine. I cough up the rubes, and Sakharov tells me to wait two in game days for it to be ready. And these days last a long time, so I do some extra work to get my money up and sleep off the rest of the time to speed up the process. Once we have acquired the Psy Protector, I decide to go and shut off the Miracle Machine, and it's a pretty much complete retread of the same mission in Shadow of Chernobyl. Fight through the lab, shut off the machine, say hi to the massive jarred brain again, and fight our way out through some pipes. I started this mission woefully unprepared, and had run out of rifle ammo about halfway through it, but instead of restarting, I decided to try to power through, so I ignored the remaining mutants and had to run past several snorks in these cramped pipes towards the end of the dungeon. And I was only able to get by these bastards by chugging an energy drink and then sprinting non-stop through the pipes, dodging snork lunges and even having to run from a pseudo giant to get out. And it was crusty as all fuck, but I eventually made it. This mission really hammered home how important being totally prepared is when doing story missions in Anomaly as by the end of most missions, your ammo will be depleted and your armor will be severely damaged. So if you're about to clear a lab or underground area, be sure that you're fully prepared not only to enter it, but also you have enough cash to restock and repair your gear when you're done. You will never be free of the ruble grind. But with our Psy protection now secured, we can now move on to the radar and shut down the Brain Scorcher. Again. So once I was ready, I headed right on over. And Anomaly actually makes turning off the Brain Scorcher easier on me, as thanks to all the maps being included, there is now a path from the Red Forest directly to the Brain Scorcher facility, and you don't need to fight your way through the long, winding, enemy and radiation infested road to the facility like you had to do in Shadow of Chernobyl. Sweet. So I shoot my way past the Monolith Guards into the Brain Scorcher facility, and again it goes down pretty much the same as it does in Shadow of Chernobyl. You have to reach the Scorcher through this maze of a lab and turn it off before the timer runs out, and when you turn off the Scorcher, the Monolith move in to attack you, and you have to fight your way out. And I enjoyed these close quarters battles just as much as I did in Shadow of Chernobyl. Headshots just feel so bonerific in these series. 
An anomaly got my shit on diamonds sometimes. Once out of the Brain Scorcher facility, we get pointed ahead all the way up to Zayton and speak to Beard at Skadovsk. And we tell him that we have shut down the Brain Scorcher and that we're looking for Strelok. Beard is floored by our work and gives us 7,500 rubles and a bottle of vodka for our efforts. Seriously, dog? You're giving me chump change for turning off the brain-melting psychic field and exterminating a garrison of monolithian shooters? I could have gotten paid that much for killing a shitty pseudo-dog in the cordon. This questline severely underpays you for your work, which was something the main series didn't have any issues with. Marked one Strelok and even that hemophiliac who decided to become a mercenary scar guy paid handsomely for main quest rewards. And I can't lie, it was a little disappointing to get under 10,000 rubles in exchange for 10 times that amount spent on preparation and supplies. I could have got more cash just going up to random stalkers and being like, Yo, you know the Brain Scorcher? That force field of lethal psychic energy that's the only thing keeping you from reaching the center of the zone and fulfilling your wildest dreams? Yeah, I shut that shit off. And if you think that's rad, mind spotting me a cool band of rubles? Or how about you join my telegram? The username is, uh, Lamont Sucks 2000. Even a nice suit of armor or a decent weapon would have been a much more helpful reward. But alas. But I know that's not Anomaly's design intention. I just love bitching about getting underpaid. Anyway, I asked Beard if he can't point me towards Strelok. And he says that one of Strelok's men is in Skadaf's right now. Sweet. And we talk to the man in question, Rogue. Rogue is an absolute dick, trying to get us to fuck off until we tell him that we turned off the Brain Scorcher. And luckily for us, he's as trusting as he is pissy. And he tells us that he came here looking for a Gauss rifle and tasks us with getting it for him. We head on over to the lab, and it's the same one where you get the Gauss rifle documents in Call of Pripyat. The Stalker classic missions keep coming. The lab is the same as it is in Call of Pripyat, except even easier as there isn't even a pseudo-giant to deal with in the large ladder room like last time. I get into the room via catwalk again and pick up the Gauss rifle, which weighs 18 kilos, god damn, and it's so heavy that it nails my character down to the floor where I stand, and I have to empty out my inventory a bit so I can move again. I leave the lab and slog my over-encumbered ass back to Rogue, stopping and going the whole way back. And once back, I hand over the rifle to him, and he finally tells us what he's up to. He tells us that Strelok has assembled a team of himself, Rogue, and three others to penetrate into the center of the zone and see what's going on with the resurgence of Monolith, until they ran into a mysterious Monolithian fanatic called Eidolon, who was seemingly invincible to bullets and grenades, and had killed two of Strelok's men, and forced them to retreat to the Pripyat outskirts. And Rogue had come here to Zaytan to find the Gauss Rifle and hopefully invert Eidolon's head for good with it. So we decided to help Rogue and Strelok in exchange for Strelok's knowledge about the zone, the Wish Granter, and all his other info for our leader, Sid. Once prepped to head out, I talk to Rogue and he joins up with me, and we have to reach Pripyat through the Jupiter Underground. Same as in Call of Pripyat. But now it's just the two of us instead of the Fortnite squad deck Tyrev takes with him. We can enter the Underground through this unassuming door. Some loading zones have some odd placements in Anomaly. Another weird one later is this basement door to downtown Pripyat from the outskirts. Just keep a close eye on your PDA map to find the load arrow, and you should be good. Traveling through the tunnels goes down the same way it does in Call of Pripyat, having you fight through suicidal Tushkano rats, snorks, zombies, and it even has another monolithian ambush in the massive domed room. And it's much easier here in Anomaly than in Call of Pripyat. Call of Pripyat snarks with some bastards. Here they're low diff from my F2000. And once we make it through the tunnel, we can head to the laundromat to link up with Strelok's squad and meet the big man himself. And it's nice to see Strelok yet again. And that Widow's Peak is as stark as ever. Goddamn. We tell Strelok we're here to help in exchange for his zone knowledge. And he tells us that there's a few chores left to do before we can spin the block on Eidolon and his goons. We have to first go to the X8 lab and pull out some docks for Strelok again. Oh god, not that fucking burr ass whooping hole again. So I reluctantly head over and turn on the generators to open the elevator to the lab again. But thankfully for me, the X8 lab is much easier in Anomaly, as the force push anomalies are much less deadly. And I'm not sure if that's due to Anomaly's physics, or my exosuit guarding me from all that kinetic energy. And since the documents are still down in this lab, that canonically means that Dektyrev did not pull out all the documents from the lab, which vindicates my laziness from Call of Pripyat. Let's go. But my absolute favorite part of this lab is that the burrs who were dutch ruddering each other in that small room can now be killed much quicker now. And you can actually stand outside of the room without getting killed by flying crates in under 10 seconds. So I got my long overdue lick back against these goddamn Jawas and grabbed three of the X8 documents before making like a banana and, yeah, you know. With that task completed, my next task is to kill a nearby pseudo giant. And I really wish the Pripyat outskirts had a vendor who sold ammo for my F2000 as it's a bit tedious to have to spend a couple thousand rubles to travel out of the outskirts and to buy more ammo in another area, then having to pay to return, as hoofing it in and out of Pripyat is a great way to get into a 1v7 battle with Monolith, and all the ammo you bought will be used up popping their heads. Cashier, you're on my shit list, buddy. Sell me 5.56 NATO, bro. I'm begging you. Please, just do it. But taking on the pseudo-giant is no big deal, and he goes down after around two mags of hot steamy lead. 
And once all these tasks are done, you can recruit Strelok, Rogue, and their medic Stitch to join you. And we all travel to downtown Pripyat to go whack Eidolon. Eidolon and his goons are shacked up in the central building, and it's a pretty tough encounter. Monolith are all over the place, and Eidolon's men are unnaturally resistant to bullets to the head. These bastards can take like 5 shots to the dome, and Eidolon himself is super durable. Although I didn't know which one was Eidolon until I found him writhing on the ground. Oh. Okay, cool. Uh, here, hold this. And with Eidolon and his men all lying dead, we can take his artifact that was giving him super strength. Nice. This will make me at least 15,000 rubles with the scientists. We talk to Strelok again, and we say that we've wiped out about half the monolith forces in the zone. Damn. Fucking exterminating these guys. Strelok says that it's now time to raid the CNPP and find a shard of the Wish Grainer. If we help him fight through to the sarcophagus, he will tell us all he knows. So it's time for the final mission, and we're gonna walk right through the front door of the sarcophagus. Strelok gives me a fairly useless AAM module as reward. I mean, I'd rather take the cash, but this works too. But with my inventory already full, I was pretty encumbered by this point. Now, any normal wise person would double back at this point and put away all their non-essential inventory items, restock on ammo and healing items, and move on to the CMPP only when fully ready. But the thought of me slowly meandering to the nearest stash made me cringe real hard, and I had done so much goddamn walking to get to this point, and I decided enough was enough. So I pushed on and hauled my encumbered ass through the power plant and the dozens of monolith goons who were waiting to bust a cap in my ass. The final raid on the Chernobyl nuclear power plant is very similar to Shadow of Chernobyl's CMPP mission, but this time we don't have to worry about crusty helicopters raining violent death on us as we approach the sarcophagus, which was very pleasant. And once we fight through some monolith guards and some chimera mutants, we enter the sarcophagus and take on the monolith meat grinder, and it's a super tough battle. There's way more enemies here now than there were in the Shadow of Chernobyl mission, but we're also getting buffed up by our three companions, so it evens out a little bit. The Russian voice is also back, beckoning us back towards the wish grinder. Anomaly's engine is getting pushed to its absolute limits in here with how many enemies and friendly NPCs there are shooting at each other, and I was running into some pretty solid jank. Went around a corner to see 5 or 6 enemies standing in a huddle like they just all spawned in together, which made them easy to mow down with quick headshots. And at the spot where you're supposed to take the ladder up to reach the secret monolith control center, climbing up the ladder is now a damn death trap, because the game has like 8 hostiles shoved into this small hallway and they'll just mow you down as you climb up the ladder completely defenseless. So I hid under the ladder and tried lobbing grenades to liquidate the guys above me, and both my companions and the enemies were ascending and descending through the ceiling using a divine elevator of some kind. The zone works in mysterious ways, man. But eventually I get the grenade lobbing to work and wipe out the upper floor, and move on to the monolith control center. It's another meat grinder of a battle, and we even fight these ghostly green projection monolith soldiers, and they look pretty damn spooky, but even the ghosts aren't immune to bullets. We keep fighting until we reach the hologram room, and we can grab the wish grainer shard in the spot where the hologram used to be, and we can just leave right out the back door and turn over the shard to Strelok, who finally agrees to tell us what he knows. He tells us about the sea consciousness, the noosphere, the emissions, and why the zone is the way that it is. He also says that he quit his bureaucratic advisory job to return to the zone. Hmm. I guess he isn't as humble as I thought he was. It's a bit of a weird moment, though. It's like my past self telling my current self everything I knew, but I had forgotten. But I kind of like that, though. Strelok gives us his flash drive with the rest of his info on it, and our last task is to turn it into old Sid. We pass him our info, and Sid hits us with that unenthusiastic, great. Damn. Not that exciting, huh? And for our troubles, he gives us 37,500 rubles for our work. Now that's more like it. But with that info turned in, that's the end of the quest line. It's a fun mashup of Shadow of Chernobyl and Call of Pripyat's missions that give you something to work towards completing beyond just the side jobs. And it's great for people who have played the previous games to see what these characters are up to, and to get some extra interactions with Strelok. And although some of the quests are pretty much beat for beat the same as they were in the main series, with some only minor alterations, this was still a fun, sort of unofficial sequel to the main series, and I'm glad it's included. But with that done, and most of Anomaly's big changes examined, the question remains. Should you play Anomaly? Well. If you enjoy Stalker, absolutely. But if you're a fan of Stalker, you've probably already sunk dozens and dozens of hours into this project. The overhauled modern combat, all maps and factions available, an endless stream of side jobs and artifacts to hunt, the huge amount of new items, weapons, and armors, and meaty main quest lines are more than enough for Anomaly to stand out as its own experience and game. And for the low, low price of free, Anomaly is simply a must play for anyone who enjoyed any of the main Stalker games. However, if you weren't a big fan of the main series, I don't think the refined combat and massive amount of maps and content will be enough to overcome the long grind for cash and the massive amount of time burn traveling from point A to point B through maps you've walked through a dozen times each. I love these games, but the amount of times Anomaly turned into Cedarovich's Take a Hike Simulator was pushing the limits of even my patience at times. But overall, 
Anomaly absolutely deserves its fame and success. It's one of the most impressive mods I've ever seen. And building that monolith engine out of the X-ray engine must have been like trying to tame the fucking zone itself. It's incredibly impressive and well-crafted. And it's only crashed a handful of times on me, which is excellent for a standalone mod. Amazing job. But with Anomaly taken care of, it's now time to discuss Gamma, a mod pack for a mod. On top of all of Anomaly's changes that I just spent the last 50 minutes discussing, Gamma then drops an additional 446 additional mods on top of all of that, so the installation is more of an involved process. But it's not too bad, and the Gamma Discord's installation steps are clear and easy to follow, and I got this sucker up and running on my first try. Once installed, it also installs Gamma's Mod Manager, which is simple to use and lets you activate and deactivate mods to further curate your experience to be perfect for you, which is the beauty of Gamma in my opinion. Oh, don't want to save at fires and friendly bases only? Turn that campfire mod off and save scum your ass off, baby. You control the experience. Gamma takes all of Anomaly's modernizations, UI, animations, gunplay, sounds, graphics, models and textures, and jacks that shit all up to 11. And the Gamma models and animations are the best I've ever seen in Stalker. And it looks and feels truly modern and professional. The gunplay is fucking awesome. The guns feel truly powerful, and the loud bangs and strong recoil animations really give these guns a huge sense of power and impact, and it's super well done. And it feels almost on par with modern engine Call of Duty in terms of feedback and feel, which is incredibly impressive for modders to replicate so well. Those non-animations from Anomaly all have gotten custom animations, from your player drinking, smoking, and healing, to even popping pills. All consumables now have a custom animation to go along with them, and they're all super smooth and well integrated. And it really solves that disconnect I had in Anomaly with just the head swaying animations. Also, set animations like healing have been made shorter, so you can hop back into the fight even faster, giving Gamma's combat a faster pace than Anomaly. Mutants have also gotten updated models and textures, and regardless if you think the models fit Stalker's vibe well or not, the modeling and texturing work on the mutants look really great. And even small details like cutting the eye off of flesh gets updated on the model, and the eye will disappear off the flesh's face. And I love these small details like this. Also, look down. You now have a fully modeled body. I love games that have visible lower bodies. Pointless for gameplay, but great for immersion, and to be reminded that you're not a floating pair of arms. Gamma also adds even more steps for managing crafting and survival, and you now have a Fallout-esque limb damage system, where you have to keep track of not only your overall health, but your limb health as well as it can cause your character serious issues to be running around with a crippled arm or leg. If your legs get too damaged, so start taking damage from sprinting, which can really bog you down if you're low on medical supplies. To heal your limbs, using a med kit or stim pack won't be enough, as it'll heal your overall health, but it'll only temporarily heal your limbs, which can only be fully healed by popping some ibuprofen or some, uh, Fent after using a med kit, effectively adding another step to healing. Whether you like the more involved mechanics or hate the extra punishment, is Gamma so you can easily turn that shit off if it isn't vibing with you. Gamma's biggest changes to the Stalker formula come in the form of the crafting overhauls. And you may have noticed I didn't bring up crafting during my anomaly analysis. Which, yes, you'd be right. As I didn't really interact with the crafting system, I rather opted to just use money to solve all my issues. But Gamma is forcing your hand here, and by default, vendors won't sell weapons or armor at all. And if you ask a technician to repair your gear, they'll outright refuse you and tell it to do it yourself, you lazy bum. Well, damn. They kind of got me there. So if you really enjoyed the money grind to repair or buy a nice new weapon or piece of armor, well, you're out of luck. Because we got a brand new grind in town. And that grind is disassembling weapons you find or pick up from dead enemies to gather their parts up. And you use these parts to partially improve your gun. And you combine them with repair kits to make the fixes at your workbenches. And it's a pretty cool concept. Taking bits and pieces of armor and weapons such as barrels, triggers, bolts, Kevlar, and armor plates and so on in order to maintain your own gear and crafting upgrades yourself instead of paying a technician for them. But to be honest, I'm not super big on these highly specific crafting systems like this. I've been playing Minecraft since 2011, okay? I've had my fill of crafting over the years, since every game since then thought it needed to have some form of crafting system to keep their steps in lock with the current gaming trends. And Gamma's crafting system is a lot to take in at the start, even for a certified Stalker Trilogy completer like me. I head on over to the workbench, see that I need a weapon and armor kits to perform fixes, check with the technician and nearby vendor to see that they both do not have any kits for sale, and all my motivation deflates out of my body like Squidward at the end of that episode where he develops paranoid schizophrenia for trying to take a day off from work. It's a bit much for me. Don't get me wrong, I prefer my stalker games to absolutely be brutal and semi-plotting when it comes to progression. You can't have that payoff without paying in, obviously. But I also want to be able to get new gear and tackle challenging missions at a reasonable pace, which Gamma clearly isn't designed for. In the grindy, highly detailed borderline spreadsheet required to make heads or tails of this shit crafting systems do their jobs extremely well. But I can tell this is definitely not my preferred stalker experience. This crafting grind also extends to artifacts, as active artifacts now have a durability rating to them. Damn. 
even the magic rocks are in shit condition here. To fix them up, you can use a newly added doohickey called the Artifacts Melter, which you can use to melt down inactive artifacts to fix up the low quality active ones, which is another good concept, giving the inactive artifacts the usage beyond being trinkets you can sell for some modest bands. But it also adds an entire another layer of grind on top of the already fairly grindy process of visiting anomalies and scoping them out for any artifacts to get your money up. So if you really want to get the most out of artifacts, you'll have to turn into a walking artifact processing factory. And whoever does this, let me know how long it takes. I'm curious. If you're all about that in-depth crafting system and working towards making a custom stalker blammer that is wholly yours and completely unique to you, this is the perfect mod pack for you. But for me, I'd rather just pay someone else to fix it for me. This video is already taking long enough to come out as is. <laughs> and all this combines to create a whole new avenue of progression, as money and gear outside of ammunition and healing items are now almost completely divorced from each other. And money isn't enough to get you stronger anymore. Better get to grabbing all those bits and pieces. But outside of the deep crafting, that's a bit too deep for me. Gamma has an almost uncountable amount of small and large feature additions, fixes, and tweaks that make the experience so much more smoother and modern. And I'd be here all day if I went over all of them. I seem to have more stamina to burn, making travel a bit faster, and the PDA has helpful features like the task board, where you can accept quests from nearby NPCs, and you don't have to approach them directly to find out what quests they have on offer, which is great for saving time. And there's even a fast travel system that I don't know how to use yet. The stalker messages in social media are even more robust, having more detailed reports on deaths and stalker interactions, and there are even passive skills and traits that you level up just by playing the game, making you stronger just by doing, which is a great feature I think the mainline games could have integrated seamlessly. Why yes, I think all games should make you better at running the more you do it, because stopping and going and always being in a losing battle with your stamina bar is ass. And just the fact that over the years modders have made stalker going from looking like this, to this, is incredible. And it's just a testament to how special this series is, and how much people love it. And I think that's pretty beautiful. And Gamma is still being updated to this day, meaning I'll probably be coming back to this pack several more times in the future. And finally, I'll give my pretty meaningless take on the rift between the fans of Gamma and the fans of the original series, as many stalker boomers seemingly fucking hate this mod pack. They say it leans too hard into being tactical cool and is too much of a departure from the original game, being less of a dark, atmospheric hardcore shooter with light RPG elements, to a more run-of-the-mill modern milsim shooter with an unnecessarily long and slow money and gear crafting grind, and it just happens to take place in the stalker universe. Essentially Tarkov in the zone, if you will. And there's definitely some truth to that. Some of these guns and attachment mods seem way too advanced and clean for some broke stalker to have, and they seem out of place as a result. Just take a look at the thumbnail of any stalker gamma video and you'll see them inspecting a sleek ass gun that's blinged out the ass with some sexy modern attachments. And that, along with the de-emphasized story and stretching progression down to a crawl compared to the original series, are the main complaints. And I do agree with these old head takes. However, if Gamma is how you want to experience Stalker, that's completely valid as well. The more Stalker, the better, I say. Gamma is zero dollars and zero cents to play, and was created by a passionate team of developers who have a ton of love for the series, and wanted to craft their own unique experience from that Stalker anomaly base. And with that price tag and the relative straightforwardness of getting the mod pack up and running, it's no wonder why it's so popular. But if you're looking to dive into Gamma or Anomaly and you haven't played any of the original games, as I said before, definitely play at least Shadow of Chernobyl. It is absolutely worth your time and money, and you'll be able to enjoy these mods even more because of it. Do it. Play the Krusty Cheese Man game. Do it. He won't bite. And if you like that game, play these mods. They're fantastic, even as standalone experiences. And you can add on mods to Anomaly that seem interesting and beneficial to your playstyle from ModDB, or you can download Gamma and work backwards keeping the mods you like and shelving the ones you don't. But keep in mind that Anomaly and Gamma are best enjoyed as stalker sandboxes, rather than mainline series entries. It's your world, and these digital slobs are just living in it. And my preferred experience would be Gamma, minus the crafting systems, and maybe the saving system, and just keeping all the updated graphics, UI, and weapon mods to get that ultimate modern stalk-off experience. Just don't let these amazing mods define your expectations for Stalker 2, as that game will very likely be a much more story-driven and faster-progressing experience that only the GSC guys can give us. But that also means that Gamma and Anomaly will be able to stand on their own two legs long after Stalker 2 drops, giving us all more Stalker to go around. Sweet. And that's pretty much everything. But also definitely not. I definitely glazed over some details I'm not totally sure. But I'm basing this review on my raw experience, and this is how things played out for me. And if you had things go differently or played in a completely different way to me, feel free to let me know or tell me to shove it for being an idiot. I'm always open to learn more about this franchise, and I'm getting deep into this shit. And if this video does well, I wouldn't mind taking a look at Lost Alpha or True Stalker, or possibly doing the Mortal Sin and our other quest lines if you guys like. But for now, that's all I've got to say. And thank you again so much for watching, because I enjoyed you watching this. Goodbye.
Also got a new mic for this video. Let me know what you think. Okay, see you for real.